What if the greatest tragedy of your life was just covered up? I have never seen any anything like that before or after. This is the story of the worst marine on marine friendly fire in modern history. A story kept from the public. It's like, what did y'all have to hide? Listen to NPR's embedded podcast in its latest series, Taking Cover. Support for this show comes from Alpine Bank. 50 years young, 20 years green. Proud to support Parched from Colorado Public Radio. Learn more about Alpine Bank's history of community service and its green team at alpinebank.com. Support for Parched comes from the Grand Canyon Trust, working to safeguard the Grand Canyon and Colorado Plateau while supporting the rights of its native peoples since 1985. Learn about ways to be involved at grandcanyontrust.org. I'm on a narrow desert road in northern Arizona. The blue sky is bright and blinding against the vast landscape of rust-colored rocks. This is where, over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved gigantic canyons, like the Grand Canyon. We're actually going to go see kind of the first rapids of, of where boaters kind of start their Grand Canyon journey. I keep taking up my phone and taking pictures every five seconds. So <laughs> it's just every corner I turn is just incredible views. I'm headed to a popular spot on the Colorado River. That's also an important spot on the Colorado River's history map. Being here will help deepen our understanding of this water crisis we're in. As I've dug into the struggles along the Colorado River, I've realized that the problems go so much deeper than disappearing reservoirs. The problems start with a lack of equity on who gets a say and how we use this vital resource. This is Parched, a podcast about people who rely on the river that shaped the West and have ideas to save it. I'm Michael Elizabeth Sackis. And I'm Taylor Dawn Stagner. I'm an Indigenous Affairs reporter from Wyoming. I cover tribal issues. I asked Taylor to work with me on this episode of Parched to tell a more complete history of this water crisis so we can all better understand what it will take to fix it. Because that's what this podcast is about. Each episode will focus on an idea that could help the Colorado River and the people who depend on it. Some solutions you'll hear on this show are sort of wild. Others are already making a big difference. And then there are some that need to get done ASAP. And that's why we're starting here. The solution we're focusing on for this episode is on the must-do list. And it's got to get done first. Because, so far, the states that share the Colorado River, along with the U.S. federal government, have kept indigenous tribes from an equal say in how we use this water. And that needs to change. Many indigenous people in the Southwest have been denied the same access to the river that the states have. As a result, some tribes don't have indoor plumbing or clean drinking water. For real solutions to the Colorado River crisis, tribes are calling for legal changes to ensure their inclusion in how we use this dwindling water supply. In this episode, you'll meet two men with very different connections to the Colorado River. Their stories, told together, help us understand this historical injustice. How the states laid claim to the Colorado River and are bleeding it dry. Tucked in these Arizona canyons I'm driving through is a place on the Colorado River that's filled with that history. This place will help us understand why the first water solution before all other solutions is making sure everyone who needs this river has a real say in how we save it during its most critical hour. As Michael continues her road trip, I want to introduce you to Daryl Vihill. I grew up to toddler age mostly in Zia and Jemez Pueblo, which are around the Albuquerque area. 
Daryl has a touch of gray in his short, dark hair and a big smile. He's an avid bike rider and wears a puffy black jacket to stay warm in the snowy winters in northern New Mexico. He's a member of the Hickoria Apache Nation. Zia is the sun symbol people, and that's where my mother's from. And then Hamus, Walatoa, is where my dad is half Hamus and, and half Hickoria. And so the first two languages that I spoke were Sto- Toa and Karisan and was much, absolutely a, a little Pueblo boy, you know, not only in language, but, but how I was raised. As Daryl grew up, he was taught a spiritual respect for water. That's the level of reverence you give that stream or that river because our ancestors go back into that and they come from that as well. And then inside the kivas, taking part in ceremony, the medicine men and the spiritual people uh, at every occasion making medicine water, blessing the water and blessing the community through the water. For thousands of years, many indigenous people moved with the river, adapted to it, responded to it. Some of those people are Daryl's ancestors. On his Pueblo side, they celebrate and honor how the seasons and rivers change. The dances all revolved around the cyclical nature of the environment, and most importantly, rain and snow, in terms of what it meant to our existence. The rattle and the corn dance, you know, is like rain falling, and and the bells emulate thunder and those kind of things. That was absolutely embedded in me. The Hickoria Apache revere rivers. The Colorado was kept whole for millions of years. It flowed from its start high in the Rocky Mountains to the once vast acres of wetlands in Mexico, and eventually to the ocean. And it supported native people, plants, and animals along the way. But... All of that ended as Europeans started to make their way west. For them to grow farms and raise cattle, the river needed to be controlled. The river needed to behave. This is the West Daryl was born into in the 1960s. He grew up on three different reservations. Colonizers had confined his people to these lands. Daryl eventually started working for the family's hotel business, and later he became the head of the tribe's casino and gaming enterprise. He says his self-worth and identity got wrapped up in how much money he could make. And then, he was fired. And to this day, you know, I say that that was the best thing that my tribe ever did for me. Because he got a new job and a new mission as the tribe's water administrator. By being hired 12, 13 years ago as the tribe's water administrator, absolutely was creator-driven from the context as that, you know, I was not supposed to be on that path. This is gonna be your path now. I didn't jump in wholeheartedly to begin with because it, this wasn't my pathway to millions. You know, it became real apparent early on that there that this is something that was very, very important. And I didn't have a whole lot of idea about, you know, how important that would be. It became Daryl's responsibility to make sure his tribe has access to Colorado River water. The river that for thousands of years was just whole swelling with the rain, shrinking in the sun, in complete union with the world around it. That's not how it works today. Instead, the river is carved into pieces by gigantic dams. As reservoirs filled with water, Daryl's tribe and the dozens of others in the Colorado River Basin no longer had the same access to Colorado River water as they once did. That's why I've made this trip to the Colorado River in Arizona. Because when this river got carved up, this quiet spot is where that began. I'm just downstream of one of those gigantic dams and reservoirs, Lake Powell, the second biggest in the country. Here, people are putting on sunscreen and gearing up to float down the river 
and into the Grand Canyon. The water is crystal clear. The river is really wide here. And we're just surrounded by these towering red canyon cliff walls. Oh, wow. Just off in the distance, there's a a little herd of bighorn sheep. And then right here, what I'm looking at right now are some historic old stone buildings. These stone buildings are ruins now. Missing roofs, there's grass growing up from the floor, and walls have fallen and crumbled. They were built by Latter-day Saints. Though settlers turned this spot into a river ferry, a place to move people, supplies, livestock, and anything else they needed across the water. This place was important to their mission, to spread across the Southwest and to colonize the area with farmland, communities, and their religion. They were some of the first white colonizers here. This place is now called Lee's Ferry, after John Lee, a guy who helped get people over the river. And now, John Lee's great-great-grandson's job is to study the Colorado River. My name is Brad Udall. I have the delightful title of Senior Water and Climate Research Scientist and Scholar at Colorado State University's Colorado Water Center. I had always been told that John D. Lee was my great-great-grandfather. It got me really interested in, in Lee and some of the Colorado River history. That curiosity turned into a full-on love for the river after Brad's first boating trip down the Grand Canyon. He was 15 years old, and the trip started at Lee's Ferry. Brad became a river raft guide a few years later. You know, I have two years of my life in the bottom of the Grand Canyon rowing boats. There are stupendous views, beautiful sunsets and sunrises. There's geology to die for with rocks that are, you know, a billion and a half years old in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So there's a whole story about life on Earth, about Earth before life even. All these river trips mean Brad has spent a lot of time at the place where his great great grandfather helped move Latter day Saints deeper into the Southwest as they fled religious persecution. In order to have agriculture in the American West, you had to have reliable water supplies. The problem is in the American Southwest, especially, you do not have reliable water supplies. You have very large changes from year to year and rainfall and snowfall, and you have little tiny rivers compared to the East Coast. Brad's family helped establish communities in parts of the country that some had deemed unlivable, and they did it by diverting Colorado River water. Their success led to more Americans moving out west, which meant they needed to use more and more of the river. They built homes and fields and raised cattle, and they needed their water to be reliable. This is what ushered in the era of gigantic dams. Farmers needed big reservoirs to keep water in the bank during droughts. Embedded in the American psyche, starting around the turn of the 20th century, was this idea that the federal government had to get involved in these large-scale irrigation projects to build a stable economy in the American West. Here's where the river gets divvied up. The American Southwest states had to figure out how to share this water. So in the early 1920s, the states chopped the Colorado River in half. After millions of years, the river was whole no more. Instead, carved up. Half of the river's flows would go to Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. The other half would be for Nevada, Arizona, and California. Eventually, Mexico was added to that list. Every single drop of the Colorado River now had someone's name on it. And where was the river divided? You know, until 1922, Lee's Ferry was really nowhere. I mean, it was just a remote outpost on the Colorado River. 
But in 1922, the Colorado River Compact commissioners picked the spot, Lee's Ferry, to be that dividing line. Lee's Ferry, this peaceful spot in middle of nowhere northern Arizona, by the Grand Canyon, where boaters launch and sheep roam. This place that mostly only river rafters know about. That's the dividing line. It takes audacity to chop a river in half. This 1922 compact to divide up the river also didn't include 30 different indigenous tribes who also needed this water to survive the hot and dry west. They didn't get a share. Like the reservation system, Western water law was designed to eradicate indigenous people and culture. It moved that water to colonized farmland and states, which got busy building massive water projects they needed to support their dreams of big, prosperous cities. This is the story of Hoover Dam, one of America's seven modern civil engineering wonders. Here's where man conquered this mighty river, placing a concrete yoke about its neck, to harness its tremendous water and power resources. A concrete yoke, or collar, around the neck of the Colorado River. The language in this U.S. government film from the 1980s is disturbing. I've got images of chattel slavery. That's how white settlers saw the river as a thing to take control of for the benefit of American colonization. That's a totally opposite view of how Daryl and his tribe see the river. I laugh because of those damn dreams. Like, you know, that was the thought. We'll build these gargantuan facilities. We're going to tame nature. We're going to show it how we're going to manage. And that the arrogance of that thinking and kind of how it's tied to the general thinking of that time in terms of how we were going to develop as a country. So, I mean, kudos to, you know, fulfilling on your intent. It did create economies. It did create a, an, an opportunity for municipalities to grow. It did give opportunity for farmlands that traditionally maybe uh, weren't considered farmlands to become farmlands and to grow those economies in those areas. It worked from that standpoint. What did that do to the, you know, other opportunities, you know, for Native Americans? We continue to be an afterthought and hope uh, maybe we would go away. But the tribes are still here. After the break, Daryl's fight for the tribe's stake in the West's water future. Hey, it's Michael. Thanks for listening to Parched. I have another show I know you'll love. Ghost Train is about an ambitious plan for commuter rail in Colorado, how it got sidetracked, and where Denver and other cities might go from here. It's a question facing cities across the country. Find Ghost Train wherever you get your podcasts. Support for this show comes from Alpine Bank. 50 years young, 20 years green. Proud to support Parched from Colorado Public Radio. Learn more about Alpine Bank's history of community service and its green team at alpinebank.com. Support for Parched comes from the Grand Canyon Trust, working to safeguard the Grand Canyon and Colorado Plateau while supporting the rights of its native peoples since 1985. Learn about ways to be involved at grandcanyontrust.org. Brad Udall steps outside of his home in Boulder, Colorado, which is partly where he grew up. His boots crunch in the snow, and his breath comes out in big puffs of white. When I was younger, I used to say if there was one season that I would like to live in, I would have said winter, believe it or not. Six Fahrenheit, which is friggin' cold, but it's beautiful out here. As a climate scientist, Brad thinks a lot about water. So when he looks out on the snow-covered mountains, he knows it'll eventually melt 
and become part of the Colorado River. It's been a good snow year so far. But it's not a solution. People really want want to be short timers here and think somehow that one good winter is going to bail us out, and it isn't. Brad is known for these kinds of not-so-uplifting messages. And that's earned him a very esteemed nickname. I don't know who where this came from. I don't know if I came up with it or somebody else came up with it. Um, I call myself the skunk in the room, but I, I wear it proudly nowadays. Brad is always pointing out that the country's largest dams, reservoirs, and water projects will go dry if we keep ignoring climate change. And here's where things get complicated for Brad. He's not just connected to John Lee of Lee's Ferry. He's related to people who got some of these water projects built. Back inside, Brad points out some pictures in the hallway. You know, my father was six foot five, and I obviously got my father's genetics. (laughs) Brad's dad, and also his uncle, played key roles in the U.S. government to move water around the hot, dry Southwest. They were especially involved in the massive Central Arizona Project. The Central Arizona Project pumps Colorado River water hundreds of miles to cities like Phoenix and Tucson. That's how the suburban areas of those cities can keep exploding, even now. Brad's dad was an Arizona congressman at the time, and he advocated for moving all that water. In this 1968 photograph here where the Central Arizona Project is being signed, you know, there are 30 people in this photograph. They're, they're all white guys. There's one woman, the president's wife is here. You know, my father's the tallest. My wife somewhat uncharitably says he's the guy with the big ears. The other tall guy in the photo is Brad's uncle, Stuart Udall. Stuart was the secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, which is charged with moving water around the Southwest. So Brad's family was powerful. His dad was a congressman and his uncle, the secretary of the Interior, at the same time. And they were hungry for dams and reservoirs. I mean, you're the person who's telling people that this is not working, but yet your father and uncle built it. How does that, I want to know how that feels, because that's pretty fascinating. Oh, well, I mean, mixed emotions would be the two words that would come off the top of my head. It's lonely at times because my message for 20 years now has been, watch out, we've overdone it, we need to cut back. And this is going to get worse. And that's not a message that for years anybody wanted to hear. Yet it's these gigantic dams and reservoirs that have allowed millions of people to live and work in the Southwest. They help grow millions of acres of food. They're how huge cities like Los Angeles have drinking water how Brad's family could live in Arizona, how my family could live near Denver. I think I can understand some of Brad's mixed emotions. His father and uncle were so excited by the economic growth that dams represent for some communities that together they almost drowned one of America's most iconic landscapes, the Grand Canyon. They had no idea what they were talking about, frankly. And, you know, they grew up in St. John's, Arizona, this little tiny farming community. They thought dams and water and canals were all good things. You know, by their standards, yeah, they probably were. But they didn't know what they were dealing with. I mean, the Grand Canyon is the Grand Canyon. (laughs) The idea seems pretty crazy, right? Brad thinks so, too. But that's exactly what happened in the 1930s and the 1960s, when the country's two largest reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, started to fill with water. They drowned sacred canyon lands. Today, as they dry up, low lake levels are revealing burial sites, buildings, and artifacts like pottery. 
Daryl says the Colorado River is so much more than just a resource. What type of reverence and, and honor would you give something that's of, of spiritual nature? You know, how do you start to influence Western society's thoughts about natural resources? Brad and Daryl could not have more different histories with the river, but they both want the same thing. They want the foundational blueprint of how we manage the river totally reimagined for the realities we face today. And because Brad and Daryl are often at the same important water meetings, they've become friends. They've bonded over advocating for big changes to how we govern the river. There's not a whole lot of time to do what we need to do. And if we can be examples of coming from what people would think are diverse backgrounds, but actually maybe embedded in the same values to a large extent, then, you know, things can really move. It's, it's maybe like a couple miles, but it'll take about five minutes or so maybe to go there. When I visit Daryl, the snow is falling hard in northern New Mexico. Daryl pulls a beanie over his head and starts up his large pickup truck. This is the main town of the Hickory Apache Nation, Dulce. It's, it's pretty dry, high desert country throughout the reservation. And uh, wasn't our traditional homeland, but you know, we took what we could get in terms of what was left. At the one river that supports life here on the reservation, it's quiet. Snowflakes melt as they hit the water. It's peaceful here. The banks of the river are frozen over. The water moves slowly through the ice and under the bridge we stand on. Daryl remembers what the river used to look like before dams, reservoirs, and canals built in the 1960s and 70s took this water to other places. In the summers as a kid, Daryl used to walk here almost every day to fish with his uncle and cousins. I'm old enough to, <laughs> uh, to have been able to have the privilege of being able to see what the flows used to look like and be like. And having that as a small child, you know, being and playing uh, again on the shores here in the summertime and how grand it looked then, you know, that's something that still sticks out in my mind. This icy flow is legally Colorado River water. So this is the same water that 40 million people in the Southwest are now vying for. And it's why Daryl has joined the decades-long fight for the tribes to have rights to use this water. When the states divided up the water in the river 100 years ago, they excluded indigenous communities from the compact. Tribes like Daryl's didn't know what water they could use. The federal government helped states build pipes and reservoirs to access the water they were allocated, but didn't do the same for indigenous reservations. More water sent to tribes would mean less for the states, and that impacted people like Daryl. He grew up without indoor plumbing and used an outhouse. You have the foundational law of the river steeped in those values of a hundred years ago when my, my people and my tribe were living off rations from the federal governments just, just to, to live. Part of the need to build economies is also based in an ability to build a basic infrastructure that everybody else in this country is supposed to be entitled to, you know, water, wastewater. Native American communities 19 times more likely to, to not have indoor plumbing. 19 times. Tribes were left without a legal say in how the river should be shared and managed across the West. But slowly, over the last 100 years, they have pushed for legislation, court cases, and settlements, some of which have dragged on for decades, to take back their rights to the river. Daryl's tribe started a fight for their water rights in the early 1970s after rapid growth in the southwest started to drain the icy river Daryl is standing over. It wasn't until more than 20 years later in the 1990s that the Hickoria Apache Nation secured their share of the Colorado River. And so you have a, a group of, of like Hickorias, you know, 
who 70 some odd years after original law of the river was created and built on by the people who excluded us continue to utilize that same structure. Through all those court battles and waiting, tribes in the Southwest have collectively been able to establish the rights to about 25% of the water that flows through the Colorado River. That's more water than the entire state of Arizona has the right to use. But without reservoirs and canals, they can't use all of that water yet. Without that infrastructure, that means some of it is going to the states. This unused tribal water has been benefiting the system for, for at least a decade now. At least a decade. Despite the fact that tribes can now use a quarter of the water, the legal system governing the Colorado River doesn't ensure indigenous involvement. Tribes have historically been shut out of the room when the states negotiate on how the river will be governed. The fallback has been the state and the federal government representing indigenous sovereigns and absolutely not being connected to tribes and their needs and their not wants from a very, very basic standpoint of just having access to even like clean water. As drought and enormous population growth slam together in the highest stakes moment the Southwest has ever seen, Daryl wants tribes to have control over the future of their water. He wants indigenous voices to have an equal say in how we save the Colorado River and the people who rely on it in the face of climate change. There are examples of tribes taking control of their share of the Colorado River to help the water shortage and themselves. Just recently, the Gila River Indian community in Arizona made an agreement to conserve a bunch of water to keep it in Lake Mead and get paid hundreds of millions of dollars for it. Deals like this show how tribes' water rights can empower them economically. And it shows that, as holders of a quarter of the river, tribes need their seat at the decision-making table with the states. Daryl and the tribes bring a different way of thinking about the river compared to those who've been in power and those who have gotten us into this mess. Indigenous voices and perspectives have the potential to really change how we manage the Southwest's dwindling water supply. That's the tension in the basin in general. Understanding that, you know, the hydrology just can't support, you know, what everybody wants. Daryl has dedicated the last 12 years of his life to getting decision-making power for Indigenous people. Daryl's hoping to get the states and the federal government to legally include tribes in river decisions going forward. The kinds of decisions that will either make or break all of our futures in the West. He took this battle to D.C., where he spoke at a congressional hearing about the water shortage in 2021. It is my sincere hope that the attention and the action of this committee represents the beginning of, of a new chapter in the management of the Colorado River, a chapter in which tribes are treated with the same dignity and respect and responsibility as other sovereigns in the basin. Absolutely something new needs to be built, where not only those tribal voices are included in the conversation, but the other uh, voices that haven't been traditionally heard are integrated into that. There's some hope Daryl's work to have everyone included in the conversation is paying off. Leaders of 20 tribes signed a letter to the Secretary of the Interior urging for inclusion in upcoming negotiations on how to manage the river. During a meeting with Secretary Deb Holland, she promised more tribal inclusion. And Daryl says there's been some follow through, which makes him feel hopeful. But he says it hasn't been enough. Until something changes substantively, structurally, as I keep saying, it's all talk. It might mean nothing because there's nothing structural in place. So Daryl's work continues. And as the tribes win more court battles and secure more Colorado River water, they simply can no longer be ignored. And we can go back and we can beat up on it all we want to and blame, you know, urban development or why did we choose to live in the desert, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter. 
You know, what matters right now in terms of how we move forward is an acceptance of, of reality about the hydrology that exists and that we need to, be, to talk about equity and inclusion and, and basic human justice as part of these conversations in terms of the allocation of this finite resource. Daryl believes that people like him and Brad Udall can change the course of the river's history, that they can work together to move away from the old ways of thinking and chart a future where indigenous water rights are respected, as well as the river itself. Solving this water crisis means making sure everyone who needs this river has a say and how we stop it from drying up. Taylor, thanks so much for your help with this episode. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Michael. It's been great. Next solution to explore, one of the biggest, boldest, most audacious ideas of all. What if we could get more water to spread around so everyone could get their rightful due? What if we just brought water from someplace else? We're talking about taking floodwaters, waters that are not wanted, waters that may do economic damage, and then moving that water. And so that made me think, well, maybe it's not totally outlandish. Maybe there are some win-wins in this. That's next time on Parched. Hi. My name's Emily Williams, and I'm part of the team that works behind the scenes on Parched. Our team traveled throughout the Southwest to report this podcast over the past year. If you love this show and believe in solutions-based journalism, do us a favor. Please take some time to rate or review this podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It helps other people find Parched. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.